What about sauna? He does say that it's good to do heat. So there are three ways you can do sauna that I can just toss out as like brief things. If you want to get a really big growth hormone release for sake of metabolism, fat loss, you're training really, really hard in jujitsu and you want to recover, you don't want to sauna too often because the study that um, identified this massive 16 fold increase in growth hormone, they had people do this. It's crazy. They got into, okay, temperatures are 80 to 100 degrees centigrade. So that's 176 degrees Fahrenheit to 212 degrees Fahrenheit for five to 30 minutes is the typical ranges that people work in in these research studies. For maximum growth hormone release, don't do sauna more than once a week, but get into the sauna for 30 minutes, as hot as you can safely tolerate. So probably for you, that'll be 210 because you're. I suspect you'll be on the high end of things. Then get out for five to 10 minutes no cold exposure, get back in the sauna for 30 minutes. Then they had them do it again, out for five minutes, back for 30 minutes, out for five minutes, back for three minutes. They had them do two hours of sauna exposure to get that growth hormone release. Now for the reduction in likelihood of dying of a cardiovascular event, stroke or otherwise, the more often you do sauna, the better. So if you look at all cause, all cause mortality or death due to cardiovascular events, and you look at sauna use frequencies using the same parameters, 80 to 100 degrees centigrade, one to seven times per week. Basically, the more often you get into the sauna for 30 minutes across the week, so 30 minutes a day is better than four times a week. Four times a week is better than two times a week, and two times a week is better than one. And the reductions in mortality are really impressive. 27, if you get into the sauna the way I just described, not the two hours a day, but 30 minutes twice a week, or three times per week, you reduce the likelihood of dying of a cardiovascular event by 27%. If you do it four or more times per week, you reduce the probability of dying by 50% of a cardiovascular event. And in these studies, they rule out other things that people are doing, smoking. They even ask them, do you live in an apartment? Are you in a happy relationship? Like they evaluate other con potentially confounding variables. Now for people that don't have access to a sauna, a hot water bath or hot tub is gonna be your next best bet. And if you don't have access to that, do like the wrestlers do, which is, you know, put on two sets of uh, sweats and a hoodie and a, and a stocking cap and wrap yourself in plastics underneath all that and go for a run. But don't, please, nobody die of hyperthermia. I mean, you can die of warming up too much. Is this experience um, pleasant or stressful in the way, so is it as stressful as an ice bath, for example? Okay, great question. People always ask how cold to make the ice bath or the cold water or the shower. You want it to be uncomfortably cold, meaning you want to feel like I really want to get out, but you can safely stay in. And that's going to vary by person yeah. and experience with it. Experience, yeah. With the sauna, it's the same thing. How hot to make it? Well, don't kill yourself, obviously. Um, be smart. If you're pregnant, you shouldn't be doing this anyway. Um, but it's very clear that what you need is the release of something called dynorphin. We have endorphin, which makes us feel good. It binds to these mu opioid receptors in the body, you have dynorphin, which is the terrible feeling that you get when you're in really hot temperatures. It's also the terrible effect that alcoholics feel when they are in withdrawal. You feel agitated, you wanna get out, it's really unpleasant. It's dynorphin binding to the so-called kappa opioid receptor. Is That's what you're trying to trigger. When you do that, a number of things happen. You set off heat shock proteins that go repair broken proteins and misfolded proteins. It also makes it so that later endorphin binds its receptor more strongly. So when you have this uncomfortable experience in the heat, you literally feel better in real life when pleasurable events come on, uh, when they, you experience them. In the same way, I like to say this, that when you get into a cold ice bath or cold shower, the increase in epinephrine and dopamine is two to 300%. These are huge increases and they last many hours. This is shown because yeah, lately I've been getting a little bit of pushback on Twitter, that which is you know um, interesting place. Um, people say, well, that's just in mice. No, all the studies I just referred to are all done in humans, men and women, fairly broad age ranges. So you want to be uncomfortable in the cold. You want to be uncomfortable in the heat. And this is why I'm not a big fan of infrared saunas because they only go up to about 160, 170 degrees. Infrared light and far red light of all kinds has been shown to be beneficial for wound healing, acne, skin, eyes. There are even guys now putting on their testicles because it can increase testosterone and sperm production. Yeah, hormone release. Hormone release. But 
in terms of the sauna, you want that strong heat stimulus. Yeah, and so, that's when you get, crawl up to the 200 mark right. and so on. Whenever I'm in New York, and there's also one in San Francisco, although the one in San Francisco is, is clothing optional, just to warn people, there's an, a place called Archimedes Banya. Is there any scientific evidence that being naked is beneficial in the sauna? Well, in certain contexts, it leads to um, childbirth. Okay, well, I'll have to read up on that. I read <laughs> no, that somewhere. But um, I, I suppose it's not required, right, uh, okay. for childbirth. But um, but in all seriousness, it, you know, in New York, I'll go to a place called Spa 88. And actually, uh, Khabib's picture is on the wall. He goes there. Oh. And it's a, it, there that one, it's clothing. It, it, they require clothing. I only just say that because it, it can be a little bit of a shock to people sometimes if they kind of walk in there, a bunch of naked people, the one in San Francisco. I If I go, I'm clothed, mostly because, you know, I run into coworkers or things like that. You know, I... I, I sort of more uh, old fashioned in that way, I suppose. But- um, That you like to wear clothes around coworkers, yes. Yeah, in general. Very old fashioned. Yeah, I mean, it just, to me, it just seems like, you know, that just be aware. But but nonetheless, the, the banyas have very hot saunas because they're Russian owned. And in New York, there's one on the Lower East Side, but uh, the Spy 88 place, they have some saunas that the moment I get into those, I have a hard time catching a full breath. It burns. They've got a cold dunk that's like a shock. And then they've got a sauna, a wet sauna steam room that's a little mellower. So the nice thing about a banya is you can kind of find your place. And then they do the plaza where they take the eucalyptus leaves and you can pay someone and you basically, you cover your groin and then they beat you with the the the, the leaves. And it's supposed to bring the vasculature to the surface. I've only done it once. And frankly, I found it um, to be a little bit um, unnerving. I didn't really like the experience, but I, I'll try and get into a sauna as often as I possibly can, which is, you know, once or three times per week. And I try and do the cold exposure, shower or immersion, but early in the day, because it really wakes you up. One of my favorite things I've listened to, I wish there was a video, is uh, listening to a bunch of stuff with Rick Rubin. And um, he did a thing with Tim Ferriss, like the Tim Ferriss podcast. I don't know if you've ever heard it, but he, he forced them to do, they did the podcast in a sauna. Uh -huh. And I don't think at the time Tim Ferriss was adapted. Yeah, if you're not heat adapted, it can be pretty stressful. And uh, I mean, obviously the whole experience is stressful as, a, as somebody with, with microphones, like what what is happening? But I just love that Tim was vulnerable enough to kind of give themselves over to whatever the hell this experience is. And I am just so happy that Rick, won like push that kind of idea and just let's let's do it. Let's That's a very Rick Rubin kind of thing to do. And we must not we like we must do this. This it, has to be done. A, a podcast that was done from a sauna continuously would be really interesting. Like you could call it like the pressure cooker or something. Oh, I mean like a regular podcast. Yeah, like it's, you have to sit with your guests in the sauna um or they have to sit in the sauna with Without well, those one of the interesting things is um it was a sad thing because I believe there's no video of that podcast, but you could tell there was a kind of, there was suffering, on, especially on oh, Tim's sure. part. It was like a degradation. He 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 started over time not being able to put words together correctly, which he's very eloquent. And so you could see there's like, <laughs> the heat, there's a struggle. <laughs> heat and cold pull you down from the inside. You have to, I mean, there's a reason why the screening process for, um, make, you know, seal, seal, they call it seal training, but it's really screening and training involves cold waters. Cause you know, you, if you're in the heat too long, you'll die or damage tissue in cold. You can do it quite extensively before you die or damage tissue, but it is stressful. I was going to say one thing that, um, I sometimes enjoy seeing these social media posts where people will get into the ice bath and they'll look really stoic. Like they're really tough. Mm -hmm. Um, but actually that's the wimpy way to go through it. When you get into cold water, if you stay very still, you develop a thermal sheath around you oh, that you're warming yourself. The The really bold way is to get in and continue to sift your arms and legs, and it ends up feeling miserably colder. And then- there's no sheath. Because you're, you're breaking, up, the, you're breaking up that thermal layer. And then when you get out, you'll notice a lot of people huddle or they'll, they'll put, or they'll grab the towel. In general, that's me. I'll get back, I'll get into the sauna. <laughs> But if you really want to stimulate the big increases in metabolism, you stand out there and you dry off with arms extended in open air. And as that water evaporates off you, it is really cold, but your body is forced to activate a number of the warming programs related to metabolism. This is the beautiful work of a woman named Susanna Soberg, who's um, Scandinavian. She published this paper last year in Cell Reports Medicine. And so I call this the Soberg principle, which is 
if you're doing ice and heat for whatever reason, it doesn't matter if you end on heat or cold, but if you're using cold specifically to stimulate an increase in metabolism, end with cold. That's the Soberg principle. And with cold, yep. if you're alternating, and then uh, if you wanna do it the tough way, you let the shivering, so sort of you just stand out and let the water evaporate. Yeah, I mean, if you ever waded into a cold ocean, yeah. you know, everybody's kind of like holding themselves, you know, if you really just, if you let yourself extend your limbs and move them around a bit, so you break up that thermal layer, uh, that's that's the tough way to do it. So when I see people on social media getting in and they're like really tough and trying to look hard. Yeah, you, you, know? you wanna be moving around. Yeah, be, smiling, talking, moving around is way, way colder. Yeah.